Hello, everybody. We're just going to give a few seconds for um, our uh, audience to get in the room. Certainly, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar today, our best practice forum. Um, we're very excited to be focusing on uh, training and training effectiveness. And, and the title of this particular forum is Maximizing the Impact of Your ENC Training Program. Um, I would like to, first of all, thank NAVEX uh, for being a sponsor for this forum. Um, I'd like you also to open the chat box. We always like to see who's, um, who's in the room and you may see some people who you know. And it's a great time to connect with your colleagues and, and your peers. Um, as you go through the program, uh, you may have questions. We hope that you do. And we've built in plenty of time to address your questions um, and your comments. And so uh, to enter those, you would go to the poll tab um, that is next to your screen and use that for your, to enter your questions. Um, I think that this, uh, by the way, my name is Ernie Broughton. I don't know if I introduced myself. I'm a senior advisor with the ECI. And, um, and I'm particularly excited about uh, this particular forum uh, because um, of, of the importance of having timely and memorable and engaging training around ethics and compliance for employees and also for leaders. And, uh, and the importance, the dual importance really of assessing the impact and the effectiveness of training efforts. Um, so today we've got um, presenters from Thrivent and T-Mobile uh, who will be uh, talking about how we identify content areas um, for our training, how we inspire and empower employees to follow their own interests and, and sometimes to enroll in, in content that is above and beyond the expectations of their roles and their jobs, um, how we build feedback loops uh, and so where, to where we can modify training um, and evolve it. Uh, uh, based on learner experience. And, um, and then finally, adapting the training content uh, to the context of work and uh, making it relevant and uh, timely. And so uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our first presenter. Uh, Katura Pestel is the Director of Business Ethics at Thrivent and is responsible for the ethics program at, at Thrivent and its subsidiaries. Uh, she also serves as a fraud administrator for their anti-fraud program. She's been there since 1999 and has held a variety of positions in ethics and the organization, including uh, roles in project management. Um, she has a CFE and fellow Life Management Institute designations, an MBA from Metropolitan State University in Minneapolis. Uh, Katura, we're really excited to hear what you have to say and what your experience is at Thrivent. I want to welcome you and I turn the program over to you. All right. Thanks so much, Ernie. I'm excited to be here. I'm going to share my screen and then because of how PowerPoint works, get the slideshow up. Um, so I am Director of Business Ethics at Thrivent and at Thrivent, if you're wondering who we are, what we do, um, we help people achieve Oh, of course, it flipped to the wrong version. Apologies. So as everybody knows, when things don't work exactly the way that you're expecting, you just have to pick up and do it the other way, right? Um, so let me try this one more time here. We help people achieve financial clarity. So Thrivent's a holistic financial services organization providing advice, investments, insurance, banking, and generosity programs and solutions to help people make the most of all that they've been given. Uh, um, your slides aren't yep. trying to stay. I'm, I, yep, I'm gonna get it here um, one more time. And once I do this, it should actually function the way that I want it to. My computer, I'm getting a new one next week. It's still showing the wrong one, isn't it? If you uncheck the presenter view at the top of your PowerPoint, it should make that go away. Okay. Uh, on the slideshow tab uh, in the center underneath All the right. screen. Thank you. 
Um, let me see here. We will still make it through on time. So it's better to do which, my apologies, because it was functioning previously. So you want me to just do this and do the, the individual slides? Uh, you can do that, or if you click on the slideshow tab at the very top, top of your screen on the file bar, uh, a little further over. Uh, no, uh, one bar up further to the right, slideshow. Uh, in the middle of your screen on that next tab, it says use presenter view. There's a checkbox about halfway over to the right. Uh, a little too far. There, you, you overpassed it. And I've used timings and show media code use, but there it is. There you go. Now you can go ahead and hit from the beginning. Well, it's still showing the weird. Uh. I'm sorry, we did this in the other room and it was functioning, of course. So the goal today is for me to help be able to um, share ideas for when you feel like you don't have enough money, time or resources, which you get to see here, that's how I felt just now, right? Not enough. So um, this is showing the correct one, right? Yes, it is. All right. Um, is it on the objective slide? Um, are you paused again? It's on innovating trader strategies and ethics of compliance. Mm -hmm. And it says that I'm screen sharing, but one of my slides is showing just the title slide and one is showing the objectives. Here we go. All right, now we're in business. So many times you feel like you don't have enough money, time or resources. And so what my presentation is going to do is empower you in ways of knowing what are some resources so that you can identify content areas to fill gaps in knowledge areas that you might have, empowering employees to follow their interests and needs. Um, I'm going to share an opt-in where people actually, 18% of people took more training than was required. And then ways that I have found to deliver timely training with cost-effective strategies, um, using things that you have available to you, helping with that money, time, and resource scarcity that we sometimes all deal with. Um, just to set the stage, what I want to explain is that um, I have come up in this space without having a lot of money, time, or resources. So I've been in the ethics space at Thrivent since 2005 when I was a project manager, and my project was to build out the code of conduct. Um, and then since then, absent a uh, period of time where I lived in Peru and was on sabbatical, um, it's mostly been me for the duration or me and a little bit. And for the last five years, me and one other person, but we're the ones who do ethics. So it's not a lot. Um, we don't have heaps of, um, of money, time or resources necessarily. We get what we need when we ask for it, I do think, but it, it's not like we have extra or a lot. So just wanted to let you know that I am coming from that same kind of, of space as well. Um, identifying content. So how do we actually fit into um, filling those knowledge gaps and what are we doing? I'm very, oh, all right, so my buttons weren't functioning here. I'm very sorry. All right, filling the knowledge gaps. So these are ideas that I've come up with for where I can go and actually get and understand what knowledge gaps might be out there or what don't I know that people don't know. Um, so investigation trends. One of the responsibilities that I have is investigations. And um, I can look at system reports. There can be anecdotal things. You know, even if it doesn't come up on a report, you might feel like for us lately, we've been having a lot more situations where people come to us and are certain that there's policies that have been violated. But when we look at it, it's more what we would classify as um, questionable be behavior or behavior that maybe isn't aligning with our leadership expectations, but it doesn't rise to the level 
of an actual policy violation. So some of what we're doing with that is making sure that we know and understand the people who are on those front lines, managers, some of our HR partners, what to do with that as an example. Uh, root cause analysis can give you insight into, are you seeing a lot of the same kind of problems come up or are you seeing a big problem or a concern where somebody just doesn't understand things? Uh, industry hot topics, I think those can be great places to know and understand what should you be addressing. Me Too is something that, for example, where we addressed, it was in the news, people were asking questions, they were primed and ready to know and understand what did Thrivent think about that. And so that was a great way for us to um, to share a, a timely topic that people wanted to know about. Ethics perception surveys, you may um, have experience with this yourself. You may run an ethics perception survey. Some people call it ethics culture surveys or other things. Um, there's many different organizations that make those available or you can run your own or you can do it in conjunction perhaps with your HR employee engagement surveys. Um, what are the hot spots? What are the dark spots? Are there places where groups might need more um, targeted training or communication? What are the comments telling you? Um, I always like to focus on things that can impact and strengthen organizational justice and comfort speaking up so that confidence that the organization has a process will implement justice um, for, for people regardless of their position level um, who they are in the organization. And then of course, comfort speaking up. When you share information about your processes or real stories, um, people have a higher degree of comfort with the process overall. Um, I have quarterly meetings with some of the people that I have identified as key business partners. And those are things that don't have a set agenda. It's just a chance for us to meet at least quarterly. And I have found that I get lots of information from that. Um, I share information with them, trends we're seeing, concerns that might be relevant to their area, uh, partners like procurement or our finance group, our HR business partners, um, our chief compliance officers, uh, different people. I'm sure you have your own people you can think of as well. Um, but then they give me information. Here's what I'm seeing on the ground. These are the kinds of questions that are coming in. This is where people are getting tripped up. Hey, have you seen this? Have you thought about this? Have you um, worked on that? And then that sometimes leads to opportunities to partner. I have shared my platform, so I have annual training that I do, but also they have given me an opportunity to have um, some of their platform sharing as well. So for example, with procurement, they've got training that they do with leaders and they've incorporated information about code of conduct and our ethics program into that training. Um, and then borrow and adapt. I just think the world benefits when we have high ethical standards and uh, people are people. So if, if there's an idea that some, industry or colleague or somebody even in another um, business has done. Uh, one of the things I love about the ethics space is people are really willing to share. And so there's probably people that you can network with. There may be um, things, for example, with the ECI Fellows Group, they've got content that's online. Uh, you can ask questions there of people. And that's just been a great way. Also, you can, you can borrow ideas and concepts and adapt what's been done. Um, so for the training showcase, what I wanted to do is, is showcase something that we call pick your path training. So we use real thriving stories I picked from the last decade, and I wanted to highlight different levels of choices and show people what happened or could happen with each of those different options. And what I encourage people to do on the intro video is really just pick the path that they thought was most interesting. So frequently, uh, content, training content, you're supposed to pick the best answer. Well, we had answers that were and options that were really not great. And you could probably look at that and guess that. We had some that were in that middle squishy category, like, oh, it might be kind of okay. Maybe it's not great. And um, we had things that seemed like to me on the outside looking in, like, well, that's the clearly the best and the greatest choice. Um, but we really highly encourage people to just pick what was interesting for them because we built information and learning into every path option. Um, even encouraging people, if you want to pick a bad decision and then see if you can re redeem yourself along the way with later options. Um, and so we had three different scenarios um, or three different roles and two scenarios for each. And we told people that if they wanted to, they could take more training. And what ended up happening is that 82% of the learners took the training path that was required for them. So they did their two 
and, um, and got good education that was targeted to their goals. 12% took double the training requirement and 6% actually took all of the training content that was offered, which was three times um, the requirement that was based on just an individual. The overall amount of time that people had to spend was not long. So you could get in and out, get your learning uh, and, and be done. But there was enough time where people didn't feel like they were spending lots and lots of extra time um, to do that. So this was just the summary slide from that introduction video. I'm going to um, pull up the training content that I have here and slide it over because after um, that slide, the, the audio with me, then what we did is we had people attest to our code of conduct. And so they did this on the front end. This is something that we have every year. It's just to me, the basic baseline of you're gonna act ethically and follow the policies, ask if you don't know, report behavior that isn't consistent and then cooperate with our internal inquiries and investigations. And then this is where people selected what they had. So I'm going to step into a leader scenario. Two. Two colleagues are riding together in a car. Sam reaches over and puts his hand on Sally's upper thigh. Sally is offended, pulls his hand off, and tells him to stop. The next day, she tells their leader, you, about the incident. All right, so that's the setup. A little bit of an interesting catch, um, right? What do you do catch, next? Right? And then this is where people had, there's normally two or three different options that we gave them. So this is the one I think most people would say, okay, probably not your best uh, choice. This is the one that I would say is kind of middle-ish. We train our leaders that you can't investigate this kind of thing on your own. You have to refer it to an investigation unit. So this is the answer that I would want somebody to do, but I'm going to, for sake of the demo, pick this option here. He didn't mean anything by it. So this alternated between um, having audio and having reading. So this is one where somebody asked a little bit more, you're relieved at least, it doesn't mean anything, everything's fine, except it's actually not. So this is a scenario where it's showing that some of these things can have long trails. Um, this is a problem where two years later, somebody is uh, that, that you were notified <laughs> had gripped a colleague's um, upper thigh, all of a sudden he's at a event and he's pinching people on their posteriors. You don't know about it, you weren't there, but what do you do? So this is a chance where you have a chance to redeem yourself, so to speak, or you just decide that you're not gonna do anything about it and so on. So this is what, um, what we ended up doing with people and it just really went over well. People loved that they didn't have to only pick the best answer. People loved that they had an opportunity to see things that were based on real Thrivent stories. And um, as I mentioned, we had almost 20% of people take training above and beyond what was required for them. Um, the last section that I have here is just talking about timely training via cost-effective strategies. So one of the things that I want to encourage you all to think about is that training, I think we often think that has to be something where we're in a classroom or there's some kind of a facilitator or maybe we take a computer-based training module or something. But in my opinion, Training is something that happens kind of on that drip strategy, where if you have communication, if you have a story, if you have any of those other things that I mentioned, of course, that's training. Um, but even somebody listening to some level of communication is training as well. So one of the things that we did, this is a screenshot from something that's very low budget and was easy to do. Um, we recorded a Zoom call uh, between myself and my colleague, who the two of us are the, the ethics of the business ethics office at Thrivent. And we recorded kind of a state of the ethics office um, video. It was about 15 minutes long. Um, we just hit record. It took us three tries to get ready before we were happy with the intro. And we talked about things like what are we doing for supporting Thrivent's transformation? We're in the midst of a transformation program right now. 
uh, brought up some of the interesting things that we had observed that were related to culture, like one, almost one third of our workforce has started in the past three years. Well, that has an impact related to things like how do you communicate and trans transmit cultural expectations when we've had COVID, when almost all of our people have been working remote, they haven't been in the office to overhear a conversation over the cube wall or in the office next door, so to speak. Um, and, and what does that mean for us and our work and what are we asking other people to do? Um, that group identity, making sure that people know and understand um, we tie back to that purpose, promise, principles, and values. Those are things that help us know and understand what it's like Thrivent to do. With culture and with group identity, no one person can figure out, um, you can't train people to everything that might happen to them. You need people to use and apply good business judgment, but what is it like us to do? What are the guideposts? What are we looking to to understand that? And then that mutual dependency. We also ended up talking about um, aspects of things where, what kinds of investigations have we had in the past year? What kind of categories, what numbers did we have? What kinds of discussion questions do people come? Um, ability to explain what the work is that we do. How can we help people? What kind of resources do we have available? So that was really cheap and easy to do. Another example that we do, um, this is where we're sharing platforms. HR has in-person training for people leaders that they do monthly. And this is new people who are newly promoted or newly hired into a people leader role here. Well, this is one of the slides that we talk through. So this reinforces a computer-based training module that they get that talks about what is your role as a leader and covers the ethics space as well as several other um, HR and legal requirements, things like leaves, uh, where do you need to go to get help on that? But then we have a chance for people who are learners maybe in an auditory way um, or do better with the ability to ask questions in real time. And we have a chance to reinforce that. So that's another thing where that shared platform comes into play. Um, one of the things that I have been an early um, and continued proponent, uh, continued to um, support is real stories. So you can use real stories in any number of different ways. And I've used them on newsletters, blogs. We're not doing newsletters or blogs right at the moment, but those were things we did in the past. You can do it on a message board. I know there's some people who um, still are utilizing, it might not be exactly a blog, but just a, a board that they post to and people can have comments on or obviously in, in formal training. Um, and those real stories, uh, the comments that I would have there is make sure that you don't have every story that you share end with somebody getting fired. Um, I've worked hard to have uh, examples where, yes, sometimes people do get fired or have discipline, and that's important to show that we take these kinds of things seriously. This is what happens if that type of behavior is found here, but also making sure that there's questions and examples and stories that show what happens if somebody just has a question, they think something's wrong, but the investigation shows it's not a problem. Well, that's really important from building confidence so that people don't think just because I bring something up, someone's going to get fired and I don't know if it's a problem, so I can't bring something up. Um, it, it gets it to the right place and lets people build that confidence in the process to know that we're gonna follow what the facts are and move there. Um, I like to age stories unless there's something, um, for example, in 2020, we had in a period of six weeks, six different issues with social media. And so we turned around and did training in almost real time. I built it and got it out within three weeks with the help of our training partners. Um, because there were so many stories and I always anonymize, I pull out the specific business unit, the names of the people. I'm really focused on what are the interesting parts of the story. Um, and then often I will talk to the individuals because I know what happened and what interesting questions we got or investigations. So I may, depending on what the specifics are, reach out to the individual like I did for this question and just said, hey, would you have any um, concerns. I think your question was a really interesting one, and I'd like to use it as an example of the kinds of things people might run into where the policy isn't going to address it exactly. And she said, oh, sure, of course, absolutely. That's fine. Love to share it. Um, these are several different internal communication ideas that I've had and used, and my slides are available in a PDF as a download, so you'll have all of that there. But just some of the ideas, some of them I use and some I don't. For example, because of being in financial services and the requirements related to retention of data, we don't really use mobile apps, but I think people who do have a mobile app, that might be a great way 
um, to communicate little messages. Um, screensavers, we've very rarely been able to do that, but that's something I've heard other people use to good effect. Um, so these are just a, a variety of examples. The ethics awareness events wanted to talk a little more on that. So in March is when we hold our ethics awareness month. Um, that's because it's for the financial services industry. I know SCCE does one in September. Uh, you could do one on your own time frame or schedule. Um, the very first time that we did it, just a little jump in and it was a poster and an article, but then I've had all of these different ideas um, and things that we've done. So the leader panel have done that with senior leadership, have done it with board members. So that was two different years that we did a leader panel. Um, we've brought in outside speakers. Uh, we've done things on our own and just stepped through a case study and had people talk. And with things like Zoom, you can do breakout rooms. And um, there's all kinds of really nice ways where this doesn't have to just be in person. Um, it could also be virtual. And we've always recorded them and made them available for later playback. Um, we've done road shows. So to me, I'm always on the lookout for are there natural connection points where people are interested in listening and learning. Um, so we did it at program launch. We've done it periodically. Um, if people have a lot of questions or a lot of concerns, sometimes we'll do it topically on things like gifts and business entertainment where we're getting a lot of questions. We're going to be doing one shortly on conflicts of interest because there's a work group that has um, a significant amount of people who have outside work as well that can lead to conflict. So we're just gonna talk with them, kind of getting out in front of the problem. Um, we've done it when we have newly acquired business entities. And then sometimes after an investigation, people are really worried um, somebody may disappear and people are concerned, am I doing something wrong? Is that going to happen to me? And so that has been sometimes a good amount, um, a good time to do that kind of roadshow as well. Um, so at the end of the day, I've thrown a lot of ideas and these are things that I've done over the past 15 years. So I certainly haven't done all of them every single year, but if you're looking at what can you do, hopefully there's been some um, idea here that you haven't already tried. And to me, it just starts with one thing. What can you do? Is there some kind of modification you can do? Can you share with another group? Can you do one thing? Um, and I wanted to put a um, plug in for ECI. They have a Talking the Walk series. And that's free to members. So if you go to the ECI website and um, search for Talking the Walk, you'll find that. If you're a member, you can use it. Um, you can see an example of what they have and they are available uh, for purchase as well. Not To me, this is just something that has been a nice resource that ECI makes available. And that's something where you can use and adapt. And then uh, maybe these ideas have caused you to brainstorm something um, or move into an adaptation idea as well. Um, so with that, we're still finished on time. If you want any more information, I've posted my uh, email here and I'm happy to share or um, talk through ideas with you, share maybe some more detail if you're wondering. There's some of the things that I have cleared that I can actually send out um, examples of, uh, outlines or so forth that I've utilized. And then if you have any other questions about Thrivent, um, the next slides just kind of talk about who Thrivent is. So if you're curious, that's in the slide deck as well. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to you, Ernie, for our next presenter. Thank you so much, Katura. And that was a, a great presentation. Uh, you know, there were so many practical ideas uh, that you shared. Um, some of them, uh, first of all, I love the training that has the choice architecture. Um, I'd be curious if there are other people who, in the audience who use that same kind of approach and, and, um, and, and uh, how that benefits them or what their experience is with it. Um, another thing I really love is the Zoom recording, um, especially like around program activities, because that's a great way to promote transparency and, um, um, and, and familiarity with the processes. Um, just really um, is great in terms of, I think, building um, uh, credibility and trust with a program. Um, the Ethics Awareness Week, I'd love to see more um, mm -hmm. ideas about that and more sharing because every most people do it, but I, I think that there's a lot of practice sharing uh, that potential with regard to that. Um, your, um, and your monthly leader sessions, on Zoom, I think one thing that's great is how uh, we've collectively taken um, uh, some of the 
um, technologies that came out of the pandemic and we're redeploying them um, in ways that people are familiar with. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so that was really a great uh, presentation. Thank you so much. And again, as we go forward, if you have questions, uh, please do use the polling tab. Because <clears throat> we have, uh, built in plenty of time to do that. And um, our uh, next presenter is from T-Mobile, uh, Dr. Joe Policino. He's a senior manager of professional standards training. And uh, Joe's been a leader in the field of, of learning and development for over 40 years. Uh, from 2016 to 2018, in fact, he served as a senior vice president for training and awareness at NAVEX. Um, his expertise covers compliance and ethics, leadership development, sales and technical training, human capital and talent management, training assessment and evaluation. He has a doctorate in education technology from Pepperdine. And uh, he's, for those of you who know uh, Joe from LinkedIn, he's also the author of the LinkedIn Learning Courses, um, Brain-Based E-Learning Design and Instructional Design Essentials. Um, and so it's just a real pleasure, Joe, uh, to have you here engaging our community of practice. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what you have to share with us. So it's over to you. Great. Thank you, Ernie. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. And let me now do the share screen piece. Um, I think we're good. Okay. Another share of the note. Oh, there we go. Is that, do you guys see the screen? Yeah. We're, current, we're currently seeing your other screen there, Joe. Uh, okay. Let's get out of this. I think when you do this uh, screen share, it was screen two from practice. Okay. How do I get out of it? Uh, go ahead and click stop presenting at the top. Okay, stop share. Okay, share screen. How about now? That looks great. Good. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, as Ernie said, I'm senior manager at T-Mobile for a professional standards training team, and mostly what we do is uh, compliance and ethics training. Although we have a few other other programs that fold in under me, but the main emphasis is on our code of business conduct training and other various kinds of operational compliance training. Um, so relative to today's talk, okay, why isn't the slide advanced? Uh, try clicking on there the screen is. and then okay, it should work. Got it. Um, this is you know compliance and ethics training or ethics and compliance training, <laughs> whichever word you use first. Uh, training for the max and the program here is about getting the most out of your project with the greatest learning engagement and impact. And I'm going to touch on four out of the five uh, parts of the of the webinar description: risk assessment, reducing seat time, learner feedback, and interesting, relatable, and relevant um, training. I'm not going to do anything on the follow your own intent and needs and pick your path, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, Victoria, your presentation and we're inching our way towards something like that, but I'm not gonna really address that now. I'll focus in on these other things and hopefully what we've been doing at T-Mobile will present some value for you in terms of these uh, four, four topics. Um, we tend to organize our mission around four key activities. One, obviously compliance. We wanna make sure we check all the boxes for DOJ guidelines, the laws in various states, our own our own policies, et cetera. Um, our second mission is to mitigate risk where we see it um, so that we minimize the potential for wrongdoing. Um, we especially focus in on culture. Um, we have learned uh, at T-Mobile that one of the best ways to present our compliance and ethics training is integrating it deeply with the very strong you know, magenta and carrier culture that we, we have here at T-Mobile. Uh, and then finally, uh, our brand. Uh, you know, how can we use uh, compliance and ethics training to um, 
uh, promote our brand both internally and externally. So we try to, with our senior leadership, um, identify the value we bring to the table. And this is you know, how we get the resources and budget that we do relative to accomplishing these four missions. And as you can see here, these are you know, the things that we do, you know, in current compliance, providing um, effective and periodic seen and training company-wide, certified and employees attest to the code. When it comes to risk, and we'll talk in more detail about this, apply risk analysis and incident reporting to the topic coverage in our, in our training. Uh, measure the effectiveness in terms of reducing or mitigating risk. And then finally, in terms of the culture, making sure everyone, all our employees, uh, understand the value and usage of our code, why it makes us a successful company, why it makes us a company that you want to work for. Um, modeling, do it the right way always, behavior, norms and behaviors. Um, testing for competency and providing remediation. That's a key element, as you'll see, to how we reduce training time, seat time. Um, providing ethical leadership training for people managers. So really engaging our people managers as co-participants in the training effort uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, our code states very clearly that it's managers who are responsible for making sure their employees complete their training and that there's conversations about the code and how it applies to their day-to-day -day, uh, environments. And finally, the brand, we wanted to make sure we put out training that really demonstrates the you know, authentic uncarrier spirit and, and the leadership that um, it brings to the table. Uh, and then, of course, to represent and promote the T-Mobile brand, as I said, both internally and externally. So that's that's sort of the, the, the bigger picture context of what we're trying to do and how we relate to um, our, our leadership and the ongoing dialogue about budget and resources to do the work that we're doing. So I joined T-Mobile in 2018 after a two-year stint at Navex, where our, our moderator, Ingrid, taught me everything I needed to know about compliance and video-based training to make me extremely dangerous. And, and, and it turns out that's what T-Mobile wanted. They wanted someone to come in and really shake up what was a sort of a traditional but program, but, but the one that really didn't, really didn't access the culture in any meaningful way. So for example, on day one, 2018, day one, you would get your, the LMS would assign you a whole bunch of courses. Here's you know, the usual suspects, code of business conduct and avoiding conflict of interest and, and insider trading, et cetera. And it was assigned in no particular order. There was no coherent framework for it. And there was no cultural context. We, we, we had courses from a variety of different vendors. Some of them were homegrown. Uh, very few of them had anything to do with our own culture and brand. You know, a few um, logo inserts here and there was about as far as it went. So it really didn't do the job in terms of bringing a new employee into the company and really showing them what it meant to live one of our key values, which is do it the right way always. So we set out, so okay, what do we do about this? And we came up with three key insights. The first one is something that I think gets neglected all too often, and that is that new employees and tenured employees, by that I mean people who have been around for a few months at least, have very different training needs when it comes to compliance and ethics. And a lot of reasons for this. One is they may be coming from a completely, well, they are coming from different places where they may have a completely different approach to compliance, to ethics, to you know what's right and wrong, uh, and the training experience itself. And so we wanted to make sure that whatever training we offered new employees address that element of their transition into a, a new culture, which as you can see here, everyone's wearing the gear, I have mine on today, et cetera. And to really make sure that the, the training is focused in on the culture and the, and the context. Uh, by the same token, tenured employees <clears throat> don't need as much of that. They're already, uh, by virtue of having been around, they're already in the culture. They're already understand what it means to be uncarried and what it means to do it the right way always. And what they need more than anything else is refresh, reminders, remediation um, that will focus in on the key areas that need focus in on, uh, that, that are either, you know, issues that, that arise that we need to focus people in on or something from the outside that's new and different, maybe a new law or regulation. And so we decided we don't want to give 
the same set of courses to our current employees and annuities. And, and many of us, and I remember from the customers I used to work work with that when I was at Navix, is that every couple of years they want to mix up the training. They want to give them new training because people get bored with it and, and they wanted to they want something new and different. So we we were determined to make sure that we, we were always refreshing our training for our tenured employees. Number two insight was dilemmas and decisions do not take place in a vacuum. They take place in the real world in very nuanced and subtle ways. And so we wanted to make sure that the training we were offering was not about the policies and the laws and the rules and regulations. As important it is to know about those things, but they were about the application of what doing it the right way means in the actual environment. And so we wanted to make sure we were presenting dilemmas, uh, decisions that are contextual and real, realistic, and relevant. We're going to talk a little bit more about how that played out. And then the final thing was that in order to really do that, we needed to tell real stories. We needed to really actually model behaviors and not just tell people about behaviors. And we really need to make sure we engage learners at, a, at, an, at an emotional level where they were connecting um, their own personal experience with the application of the code in, 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 the, in the real world that they were in. So with those three insights in mind, we determined that we needed a new learning architecture for compliance and ethics. So no longer were we gonna have a situation where every year, Every employee took a series of courses. In February, they took insider trading, and in March, they took harassment, and in June, they took conflict of interest. And they checked through the same courses that they had that they had done in previous years, and that was the end of it. We wanted to do something completely different. So here's how we started. First of all, we brought some um, uh, context and coherence to the new employee training. So we took all of those courses that you saw. And we gave them a learning journey that took place over three weeks. We gave them a welcome package. We gave them ways to uh, actualize the training that they got. So you can see there, like at the end of week one, uh, or I'm sorry, at the beginning of week two, there'd be an introduction. And what we do is ask them questions that left them off of week one, where, you know, have you talked to your manager about what you learned? What have you noticed about the culture that supports what you learned in the social media course, for example, et cetera? And this, this allowed us to really um, uh, lock in the training experience for the new employee around the culture, around their participation in the culture. And it's not just about learning all the laws and regulations. It's about living a value of doing it the right way always. And here's the modeling and how you do that. Now, what we wound up doing, and we're actually, it's 2022 going into 2023, we're actually just finishing the final overhaul of each course that um, is in this journey to reflect that um, learning architecture, to, re to reflect that type of training. So, you know, going back to what something Katura was saying is that, you know, you, you, you can't do everything all at once. You got to do it step by step. So it was a, it was a four year process to completely overhaul the new employee training. And we finally accomplished that. Now, what do we do about the, the tenured employees? So the tenured employees, we decided that we would create a, a in a sense, a TV network. We, we said, you know, what, let's actually produce a TV show that will demonstrate and model the behaviors that we want, you know, that we want people to learn and and uh, uh, you know, bring into their experience in the workplace. And we thought that the metaphor of a TV show network would actually help to make the compliance and training something other than compliance and training and compliance and ethics training, but that was recognizable to people. Everyone knows what a, a season is and an episode. And this, this metaphor gave us a way to present the compliance and ethics training in a very new and different way that was in itself more uncarrier-like. Um, so by creating this very familiar structure, you know, everyone has a favorite TV show and they binge watch and all of those things. It was very easy to socialize and for people to <clears throat> adapt and adopt the new training um, experience, the new learning experience, um, rather than, oh, here comes more compliance training. It was, oh, what's going to be in the new episode? So by contextualizing it in this, in this framework, 
it, it gave it a new life and it gave it something that was um, able to be shared the way you know people around the water cooler talk about what happened in the episode of some favorite show that they watch. It created that same kind of atmosphere. And it's worked. This has worked um, even far beyond um, our very optimistic um, uh, projections. Here's, here's what it looks like in general. So this is something our tenured employees get. So we have a season. So we just are finishing up season three, 2022. And you can see here that in each of six months, we produce an episode. An episode is 20 minutes long, so it's very short. This is a little bit of a hint of how we save seat time. Uh, so it's just like you know a, a TV show. It's it's 20 minutes long, and each episode starts with a tone from the top message. So we en enlisted our senior leaders, starting with our CEO, to do an intro, a tone from the top intro to each episode, which 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 first of all helps stress the the importance and the value of completing this training, and to you know do a little bit of a of a walk the walk where. Um, our senior leaders were actually involved in promoting and um, uh, valuing the training. And then each episode goes into, as you see here, the little pictures of the uh, videos of <clears throat> six different, uh, five different stories, sorry, um, that are basically about two minutes long. There's a presentation of a situation. Um, then the learner gets asked a question about the situation. Um, there's some feedback on the answer that they give. And then there's a what we call a backstory, which takes the particular episode and it has the specific scenario and it expands on it and gives the bigger picture of the compliance issues or the legal issues or the ethical issues that are behind the behavior depicted in that scenario. Um, and then we end with an are you with us, which has become kind of like a, a, a tag on to a public service announcement about some topic of interest that we wanna generate some awareness on. And then it closes with a survey. And the surveys are very important as you'll see in the way that we collect data. Um, we, um, the important thing about this in terms of content, and I'll get, to you how, I'll, I'll get to how we get to the content in a minute, but we don't, each episode covers a variety of topics. So it isn't like one episode is devoted to harassment, discrimination, or, conflict of interest. Each of these stories um, would might be about, so in, in, in one particular episode, we might have a scenario about harassment, another about insider trading. And the idea here was we wanted to make sure that these very important ethical topics were repeated and emphasized throughout the year. And it wasn't just once a year or once every two years that people were reminded of it. Because in real life, it's not like you have insider trading issues only in February, you might have them throughout the year. So we wanted to keep these topics fresh and top of mind as we, we went through. Here's an example of one of the scenarios and what they look like in video. Nice. Are you going to buy it? Yeah, I think I'm going to do it. Can you afford it? Yeah, I'm going to sell some stock to make the down payment. But what about uh, insider trading? Should you be doing that based on the information you know? That's only a problem if I know material non-public information. Like the information in this presentation in front of us right now? This information is material non-public information and it won't be released until next month. Look, I, I want to buy a house. I'm selling the stock so I can buy this house, not because I know this information. It'll be fine. Look, if, if I don't make this move, the house might sell. I, I have to sell my stock. I'm doing it. Did I just make a mistake? Did I violate company policy and insider trading laws? So what you see there is um, a scenario, a situation. Uh, these are actual T-Mobile employees. You probably figured out they're not professional actors, but they do a pretty good job. This was a key element in terms of budget resource and how to create the most impact. We did not have a budget for professional actors. So we said, well, 
we have 70,000 employees. There must be some of them out there who can, you know, maybe they were in the drama club in college or something. They can do some acting. And it, it so we went, we went down that path. And sure enough, we got a bunch of people who were pretty good at doing this. And, you know, we, 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 we launched with employees as actors. And it actually turned out to have an incredible benefit, which is that these folks are part of the culture. And so they brought with them to their performance an authenticity around the culture that really resonated with our audience. And we get a lot of really good response from that, that aspect of the uh, videos that we're presenting. Now, what will happen from here is, you know, the, the, the character turns to the audience, breaks the fourth wall, if you, so to speak, and asks for help. And the idea here was to engage the learner in the situation as if one of their colleagues is asking them for help. So they're sort of emotionally invested in, in helping this colleague. And then, you know, they'll pick the answer um, that what's the right thing to do. Um, they'll get feedback on that. Was this the right or wrong answer? Uh, and we'll give them some additional inf information about insider trading that helps put this situation into context. We're really interested in what um, Kintura, Kintura and Thriven are doing around actually now going one step further and acting out what would happen if you chose one of the sort of incorrect answers and you wanted to explore that. Uh, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but it's something we're planning for next year to sort of expand the consequences of a particular action one way or the other and bring that to the video as well. We also have a special edition for managers in which we give them additional content and a manager guide so that they have a way to lead conversations about the episode that everyone watched. I mentioned the water cooler uh, phenomenon before where managers are asked to take a conversation guide about the episode that everyone's watched and they discuss it together. And we get about 25 to 30% of our managers who are doing this form of social learning to really apply, you know, to really contextualize the lesson in the context of that manager's team and what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. This is something we want to explore more <clears throat> as we go further by introducing watch parties and deeper levels of social learning about, about what we present in the videos and the stories <clears throat> in, the, in the real world. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this. So again, the participation framework here, we, we provide the setting, we show a situation, the learner participates by uh, helping the, uh, the character with their dilemma or their decision, we give them feedback and we explain all in the backstory. Okay, some of the results. Since we launched this in July, 2020, so it took us over, over a year to really get this out the door. Um, but now we do these like every other month. And we've assigned 17 episodes since July, 2020. And enterprise-wide, we, we, you know, we assign it to every employee. We have a consistent rate of 98% completion and attestation. And back in 2018, we, went, we had a lot of difficulty getting completions to the training by the end of the year to say we've checked that box. But now, again, owing to the phenomenon of this is now a TV show that people look forward to and they, they know what's coming and they know it's always going to be new and different and they like the characters. They just go in and complete it. And, and we do very little cajoling or anything like that to drive our number up to the 98%. That is our target that we report to our board of directors. Seat time. We've been able to reduce seat time from four hours in 2018 where next year we'll be doing one and a half hours. That's partly because of the design. It's partly because, because of the, the way we've designed it and the information we've gotten from our learners about what they know and what they don't know. And this aspect of where we wanna do more awareness and not repetitive training, we've learned that we, you know, again, the, the, the training that is where specifically time is required, like, you know, two hours of supervisor training for harassment in California. That's a separate thing. But just for the overall compliance training program for employees, it's down to an hour and a half. And we feel very confident that we're covering what we need every two years, that we're addressing the most relevant risk topics uh, for our company, and 
um, we're basing the content that we deliver on the competencies that we've been tracking over the last three years. So that, you know, that's how we've done it. So rather than giving train, uh, overdoing the training and giving, throwing four hours at everyone, training what they don't need, it's very targeted around what we've determined our employees need to know based on risk and what they need to know based on their level of competency. Um, in terms of mitigating risk, we have a process that we put into place as we shifted away from standard training course topics to ones that are really focused in on risk. Our legal SMEs do a careful analysis of the risks facing the company based on integrity line and disclosures and incident reporting, et cetera. They create a blueprint of priorities of what we need to be covering. From that, we develop our design of the TV shows, our program after the year, and then we go ahead and develop as engaging, efficient, and effective content as possible. And in fact, it's going through this very careful risk-based analysis that our training does become more engaging, it's meaningful, it becomes more efficient because you're only getting what you need, and it's more effective because it's addressing the actual risks that we've identified in reality. The way this works, this is an example of our sexual harassment blueprint, where here's all the conduct standards that have a number one priority for enterprise training. And so when we were developing the program map for next year, we said, you know, we've never really covered this using internet or email systems to, you know, engage in un un unlawful sexual harassment. So we take that, we took that identified topic, we put it into our program map. It's now going to be in the next season, in episode one, scenario one. Here's the main topic. And then we go back and we look at what are some suggestions, some scenarios, whether it's texting or email and Slack, where a, an employee would engage in, 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 in wrongdoing re relative to this particular topic. And then we create a scenario, as you saw in the video, we work with our SMEs on, you know, is this the right thing? Should this person get fired? What's the consequence? Um, is there disciplinary action? Should there be an investigation? And we try to, you know, mimic the actual real world uh, events. Um, and all this is related around designing to support the culture that, that what you're learning and what you're learning how to do is what makes T-Mobile a successful company and what's, it's what makes it a, a great place to work. And in doing so, we're modeling these behaviors so that people will emulate them. And we're training far beyond knowledge and awareness. As we do. Let's skip this slide here. So let, a little bit about measurement, because I know that's part of the thing. We measure engagement, relevance, competency, and behavior for every uh, scenario that we do. Um, we have this very robust data architecture that allows us to pull data from our Workday, our HR system, and our course content. And all of that goes into creating reports that tell us what we're doing right and wrong. So on engagement, um, we have a star rating in our LMS. So since we launched this season three, we have a 92% four and five star, most of them five stars. And we get written comments from all employees. We've gotten over 12,000 written comments since this started. We read every one of them and by hand, we classify each comment about what it's about. And then you can see in the word cloud, of these 92% who have left comments, they focus in on why they like the design, why they like how informative it is, that it's efficient, that it's relevant. So we, we start to get real knowledge about what people like about this. We also pay attention to what people don't like. One of my favorite comments from a one-star review we got was, okay, horse is dead. Uh, and while they talk about efficiency, they all tell us that this is too much training, they don't like it, why do we have to be assigned so much? So there is that 5% of people who just haven't bought in yet. And this is important because while it's only 5%, it's 5%, and 5% of 70,000 people is a lot. So we're always trying to innovate. How can we make this training experience more uh, engaging and more efficient for that 5% and drive those one and two stars up into the three, four, and fives? Um, Here's some sample data. This is what some of our reports look. We do a relevance test on every scenario. We ask people say, how relevant is this to your real world environment? And then we created an algorithm that translate that into what we call a relevance index. 
So we can see here this sample data. This is an actual result. So I'm not allowed to share that with you. But this is an example of a report. We would see that, wow, privacy and security topics are high in relevance, but conflict of interest, not so much. Well, why is that? Are there particular ways that we cover conflict that is really too limited to the to a particular audience? And how do we deal with that? Um, we look at relevance by line of business. So here, this mock data shows that privacy and security is relevant to everyone, but um, it's harassment discrimination are only showing up in two lines of business, or customer service is low in relevance to these other lines of business. So this has given us really valuable information that as we go forward with new seasons, it's allowing us to really target our, our training topics to you know, what people are telling us is most relevant to them in their day-to-day -day jobs. Um, we do the same thing with competency scores. We take all those questions and answers that we ask people and we try to figure out with our legal sneeze, what's an acceptable score? Now, again, this would show, for example, that, whoa, we got only 70% correct answers in privacy and security. We need to beef that up. We need to give them more privacy and security content, especially in certain areas. Or, for example, we say, well, we have high competency in insider trading. And that might lead us to a decision, well, let's not do a, a full scenario in insider trading this year. Let's do something that's more of an awareness piece because people know this information already. This has been some of the keys around reducing seat time. I know I'm almost out of time. Let me just wrap up here. Um, here's, for example, how back in season two, we, we, we put out, um, this is actually a, a, a sample as well. We put out, a, 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 but it's typical of what we get. In season two, we asked about information classification. We got 73%. The next year, we saw that our competency level around this increased. So we're tracking uh, knowledge acquisition and skill and behavior acquisition across um, uh, the years. Um, we're tracking behaviors. This is be speaking up behavior. This isn't necessarily tied to the lessons. This is, if we might've done a lesson about speaking up, then we'll ask people, well, how comfortable are you speaking up if this happened? Or what would you speak, how, you know, how, how likely would you to speak up? And we're noticing from time to time that there's variance and we can check in with our other c &E colleagues. Well. What's, why is that happening? Is there something in the leadership? Is there something about the situations that these people face? You know, what is it that's causing this variance? And finally, we're benchmarking culture and these results that we're tracking on a monthly basis get plugged in with, with um, uh, a, a, uh, um, the, the results from our ethical culture survey, which takes place every couple of years. Um, our brand, here's a, here's a typical example of one of our tone from the top videos. You see our EVP and chief network officer. He's proudly wearing our IP65 production t-shirt, which has become a much sought after artifact in our, in our company. And he's leading the charge. He's introducing the, the episode um, uh, and, and, and really highlighting the importance of the training and why it's so uh, vital to our culture. And then, of course, this is our new front page of our new corporate responsibility report for our investors and our, and our customers. And we have a whole one page spread about how our compliance training has been designed to uh, foster our corporate responsibility. And that's it. So we try to best to share our best practice as, we do, as we're doing today. Uh, we go to a lot of conferences. Deb learned last year to talk about the training and learning architecture. And um, that's all I have. So I know I'm three minutes behind. So let's talk. Back over to you, Ernie. Wow, that, that is great, Joe. I mean, uh, again, so much valuable information. Uh, some of the things that resonated with me before I introduced Ingrid here, um, you know, most training is, has been role specific. And, um, and you introduced this tenure specific, and I've never really heard that before, but it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, the, um, um, the other thing I love is using uh, employees as actors. I think that, uh, that that's very effective. And also the use of the senior leaders and in integrating them into the videos, because um, uh, from research I've seen that it's much more likely that people are going to actually sit through and go through training when senior leaders um, are part of that training 
um, uh, the metrics that you have, how your program evolves based on real data, uh, just really a, some brilliant things that you're doing there. And so um, I'm going to introduce Ingrid Frieden now, who is the Vice President in Online Current Learning Content at Navex. And um, she's going to moderate a Q&A session for us. And, and Ingrid has been specializing in ethics and compliance training for more than 10 years. Uh, she's been the principal design and content developer for Navex's online training um, course initiatives. And, um, and for over 20 years had specialized in employment law and legal compliance. Prior to NAVEC, she worked as a litigator with Littler Mendelssohn, uh, the world's largest employment uh, law firm, and also as in-house corporate counsel for Gen uh, General Mills. You know, and, and just by virtue, I think, of NAVEX, but also Ingrid and your incredible background, that you're really on the leading edge I'm um, looking forward to hearing what you think about what you've heard so far from, uh, from Joe and from Katura, and also the kinds of things that you see on the horizon that everybody really needs to keep in mind as they develop and execute their training programs. Welcome, Ingrid. Thank you, Ernie, and it's great to be here, and um, really fascinating stuff listening to Joe and Katura, and I've had an opportunity to chat with them, and they both are doing amazing things with their programs. And um, one of the things that I, I'd love to call out is they are both doing very successful programs and they are both doing very different programs. And that's one of the most important lessons I think we can all take away from what they just presented was they each have taken this responsibility of sharing information with learners about risks and helping them make good choices and they've worked with what they have in front of them. And they've said, how can I get scrappy and how can I do something that will have an impact? And um, they have given you so much wonderful information. So I'm gonna pull a few things out that I know are, um, that will benefit all of you listening in terms of how can I do what they just did? Like, okay. How is it even possible? And the first thing I'm gonna start with is um, sort of navigating the relationships in your workplace that where you are that can support you to get to this end goal because neither of these programs were able to do it just on their own. They all had to work and collaborate. So the first uh, one is going to go Katura, and it's um, the secret behind some of the work that you've been able to accomplish is your deep and wonderful relationship with your internal learning and development team. And in my space, I'm working with customers constantly, all sizes, all complexities, and there is without question an increase in the number of learning and development professionals that are partnering with the ENC group. So you have a really great story. I'd love for you to share sort of how you work that relationship. Sure. I'm happy to. So from the very start, way back when in, you know, 15-ish years ago, um, I, I went and asked them, I always like to go with open hands and say, hey, what do you know and what do you have that, that should impact how I think about things? I just think that helps. And then you're not telling people what to do. So they've always found um, me and then now Stephanie who works with me to be good business partners that way. I've also been very open to um, implementing and adapting new learning technologies, new learning modes and models. Um, for instance, the very first training that we did is an out was an hour and a half long because that's what we did back in 2006, and people would yeah. laugh at that now. Um, similar to Joe, you know, we try to keep all of our stuff 19 minutes or less because that's what the latest insight is about um, learner appetite and um, ability to stay focused. And so you have to be crisp and, and tight. So have worked with that. And oftentimes they will come to me and say, hey, we have this new platform. Do you want to do something with it? And I'm always down for that. I come up with ideas and we have a brainstorming session where we talk about, I bring the content, they bring the ideas of how to make it work. So I came, for instance, with the Pick Your Path and said, can we track who actually takes extra training? And they went back, I don't know how to do that, but they went back and they said, I'm not sure, nobody's ever done that before. They figured out a way to do it technology-wise. And so it's really been that partnership. I think they get to have somebody who will be willing to platform and do the new things. I have somebody who's 
discipline to work with me. And then just the basics, right? Like you try to stay on deadline and you try to do what they ask you to do on the time frame they ask you to do it. Well, and I think one of the really great things is just this recognition that, you know, in the ethics and compliance space, people look to us to solve things, to have the answers, to know the path. And we've become very accustomed to that, that we, we, we need to be the one. But the reality is there are so many people in our organization that bring um, skills to the table that are that help elevate the program. And L&D is one of those. And Joe, who happens to have a background in L&D, you can see what happens when you have that learning and development uh, doctorate level mind applied to a challenge, right? And it becomes very much about how do we make this effective? But one of the challenges, Joe, I know you experience is navigating the SME trap. Um, and that as a lawyer, I'm happy to call us a trap. We love to have lots of <laughs> words in there. We like to make sure that all of the ifs, ands, or buts are covered. And um, I know that's something that obviously you and I worked together for years, but that was one of your challenges at, is figuring out how do I balance that? So what advice do you have for um, uh, those on the, on the call today? Great question, Ingrid. You know, and I, I would have to say that probably working with SMEs is the biggest challenge that we have mm -hmm. for a, a lot of different reasons. And one of the things that we realized early on that we, we needed to work on is, is the element of training the SMEs in our process. In, mm -hmm. You know, in a, we use the, a, a form of the ADDIE model, and we actually develop a playbook that we give to SMEs when we start and say, look, here's, here's what we need from you. Here's what you have to do. Here's what you don't have to do. Here's what we bring to the table. And here's how we're going to work together. And by sort of setting that framework out in front, um, and there's often resistance to that at the beginning. And there's sometimes bumps along the way when yeah. they forget, oh, we're supposed to review that. Um, or is it too late to change this now? Or those kinds of things. Um, it did go a long way to just establishing some protocols and some parameters and in, in, in very often what wound up happening along the way was that the SMEs began to appreciate our expertise and how that expertise was actually going to be more supportive of, of getting their message out than, than if they had thought it up themselves, which was going to be, you know, text heavy, legalese. And we would tell them, look, look you think like lawyers and we'll speak like humans and we'll, we'll figure this out together. Well said, and it is, it's, it, it's a, it's a really important, I would call it a dance with any of these internal subject matter experts and kind of figuring out how do you bring that to the table, what you're doing and show it to them and make them respect that and partner with you and the same thing back, back at those uh, experts, because yeah. you're all trying to get to the same goal. So, um, all right. So you both have demonstrated like really great um, I think expertise and leadership in that partnership. And that's kind of tip number one for everyone who's listening is find those folks in your organization who can help you achieve your objectives. And don't assume that you know what they can bring to the table. You may need to converse with them. You may need to talk to them. You may need a generation of ideas and start to brainstorm, but you will be amazed what people come uh, forward with, whether it's internal employees who happen to be you know, actors at heart or learning and development professionals who are just eager to get you testing some new technology for them. Those are all great stories of like things you uncovered as you path this out. Um, I wanna know from both of you, what's next for your programs, right? You both have reached a point where, you know, Joe, you're on a journey, it's been four years and you started, you're, where you started isn't where you are today. And it's that constant progress. And that's what is tremendous. It takes time. And Katori, you're the same way, right? You've told the story about advancing your program and modifying and adjusting and adding. So um, I'm Chris, uh, Joe, you first. What's next for the T-Mobile the program? Okay. So well, going to, this past year, we had <clears throat> six episodes <clears throat> in our program. Next year, we're going to bring down to four. And we're doing two things that I think are going to be really uh, useful. One is um, bringing more awareness into the episode. So as I said before, there's some topics that we realize we've trained them enough already. 
They just need to be refreshed and reminded. So next year, an, uh, an episode will only have three scenarios and two awareness pieces to sort of balance out um, uh, you know, that aspect. The other thing that we want to do, which is you know, um, what Couture has been pioneering, is this idea of really playing out the scenarios depending on what the learner uh, says should be done. Um, and I, and we, we want to tap into that same kind of curiosity of, for, of the learner, like what happens if type of thing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and rather than just telling them what the right or wrong answer is, showing them and modeling what can happen. So they really see the impact of consequences of bad behavior or good behavior. Yep. Mm -hmm. And for, for us, um, one of the things that we really want to lean into is giving people leaders support so that they can regularly and easily do turnkey conversations on ethics with their teams. Um, so we've been, Stephanie and I, brainstorming like, how do we do that? We don't have enough time. They don't have enough time. What can we do? So like, for example, we've got these monthly meeting starters that um, HR and communications prepare. And so we've been reaching out and saying, hey, four times a year, could we get a slide? Could we get a little slide in there? And knowing and realizing that not everybody is going to take advantage or, or even uses those now. But again, it's that drip strategy. Where can I put all kinds of little messages so that everybody gets something throughout the year and equipping since we know that people take the ethics of an organization really primarily from what their leader and what their peers do, how can we push down those messages into a space that's going to make a difference? Well, and one thing I really um, loved in your presentation was uh, you had mentioned like, I don't know, a manager doing some kind of a routine monthly update and they slipped an ethics and compliance slide in there, right? So you had made something available, not, you know, not a very difficult thing to produce. And it was, you were able to sort of bring it into that world of safety mentality where it's just constantly part of the conversation. And we've given people simple resources to take that step forward. And so that's a great story. That's like, you know, mm -hmm. that's just, that's just, a simple resource in action. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I want to call out in the choose your path adventure, right? And mm -hmm. um, I had a at Navix, we had a product, a micro learning product like that. Uh, we called it Ethics Street. We've retired it. This was years ago, but we we have plans to bring things back like that because they are very fun. But I want to call out that, that you both approached that kind of concept and you're going to do it very differently. Joe, you have access to in-house profession, professional level media and video production. Victoria, you're doing it in more of a text-based environment. Both are good. Both are successful. Both are taking advantage of what you have in front of you and making it meaningful and powerful for your employees. And I think that's something everyone on the call should sit back and think about. You don't have to have the highest end video production capabilities. And if you do take advantage of them, right? Because they're powerful, but you can accomplish it um, in, a, in another mechanism, uh, an e-learning mechanism that may not have all of those bells and whistles. <laughs> but for Joe, um, a question for you about um, the video resourcing and um, sort of sort of what you have available to you uh, in order to accomplish the filming that you're doing. And then my question for you is, do you have any considerations or any recommendations for others who may be able to take advantage of, I'm gonna use my own video. So employee releases, <clears throat> how do you select employees, anything like that? Well, you, you know, it, it, it goes back to what you were saying before is that you, you have to, you have to, you know, play the cards that you're dealt. And in, in some ways we were kind of lucky in that we had a guy on our team who was, you know, kind of an amateur video guy. And um, we had a studio available, a space essentially. And he said, you know, I can do some of this video kind of thing. And we, we, we believe that it didn't need to be as polished and professional that we could probably get it to the right level uh, without, you know, a full-blown, you know, production thing. And so we, we spent probably less than a few thousand dollars to buy him some new equipment. And we just 
tried it out. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, you know, the first couple of attempts, they were pretty, you know, uh, bougie and it's gotten more and more sophisticated. And, and what wound up happening was that we got our leadership to invest a little bit more every quarter on some new equipment. And now we have a dolly thing that can move along, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, um, yeah. you know, it, it, it just wound up working out. Well, and, and um, I think that's a great story, right? Because it is a process and we all, we should, the one thing we should not be afraid of is the first step cannot, we can't expect it to be perfect exactly. or everything or the Titanic filming or in, it's, it's just got to be a journey. Um, and I think one of the trends that we're seeing now is that if you, if you look to social media, if you look to what's hot, if you look to TikTok or Reels, in Instagram, you look to any of that, that content. And I've seen some really just the, it, like, I will call them brain worm pieces lately um, that are being published out there by individuals. They're short, they're pithy, they are not perfect. They have weird graphics or they have glitches or they have strange people who walk in the background, right? The, the, the perfect is no longer necessary in some That's cases. Right. And uh, so this is a great opportunity if you're an ethics and compliance professional and you have an iPhone and you can do a little filming on your own or, or create some things. Um, there is one out there on union organizing and it's four easy steps. And, um, and I, I still remember it and I see a lot of content. So, um, and it, it's, it's quirky and has a really bad pixelated dog in it and a bottle of Buffalo hot sauce. <laughs> and that teaches me the four steps on how to organize at my organization. And it, it's it's it, it it's genius in its simplicity. So, yeah. Um, now the other thing I want to talk about with both of you is demographics and representation inside of your products. Really, really, really important. Your business of developing ethics and compliance communications and training is about engaging your entire workforce, and you want them all to be represented and see themselves. So how do you balance the challenges of, you know, making your products work and making them reflect the great diversity that's in your organization? One of the things that's been critically important to me since the beginning of this program is making sure that it wasn't white centered. Um, Thrivent comes out of servicing a Lutheran population, which is primarily predominantly white. Mm -hmm. um, but we always have had people who work for us, obviously, and who are clients who are not white. And so from the very beginning, like when communication sent back the code, I said, OK, we need not as many white people as <laughs> front and center. And we need to not just have people who aren't white on the margins, you know, oh, they're in here. Um, I made them do other elements of diversity too. One of my favorite MBA classes was uh, one on diversity. And over the 15 weeks, we did a different topic of diversity. So of course, it's much more than just race, age, gender, mm -hmm. even though those are important ones. And so for instance, I made sure that we had somebody who was in a wheelchair. That was the predominant um, focus of that photo. So that's been something important to me from the beginning. One of the other things that we do is Stephanie and I think through um, what kind of names are we picking? What kind of um, pronouns are we picking, for example? So we've had pronoun situations where we use they, them. And um, we've had other situations where we try to stay on top of, and one of our key partners also would be the diversity and inclusion team. So sometimes we've had them look over our things. Does this read right? Um, is there something that we could do that's a little bit different here? Um, is there something we can do to connect? We participate in our business resource network so that we're hearing what kinds of concerns or how might somebody be feeling not seen? And is there something we can do with our platform? So that's kind of the silent piece. We don't make a big deal out of it. It's not, I mean, we just did they, them pronouns in a scenario. We didn't say, look at us with our pronouns. Right. Um, that's very but, important. That's, but that's something where I want people to know and feel seen, heard, part of things. Um, it's not about erasure. It's not about taking somebody out of things. It's about representing the whole of the diversity that we have here. It's a great point. It's just definitely something you have to be, um, you have to be a champion for that in this space. You mm -hmm. have to have a focus, but you also can't, you know, be congratulating yourself because, hey, look, we have one of these or five of these or 12 of these or whatever it might be. It is 
the, the power is in the silence and getting it right. Mm -hmm. And listening to feedback. It is a, um, a hot topic of feedback from employees, so. Mm -hmm. Joe, what are your thoughts? Because you're casting, well, and that adds a whole nother yeah, uh, so, dimension. Well, we're you know we're a pretty diverse company from the get go, so it wasn't difficult for us to find you know a, a diverse group of actors. Uh, however, th there was one, and, and Peter mentions about accessibility. We actually wound up. We realized that because we we had a couple of situations that were accessible situations in our scenarios, and we realized you know. We have a person here who's in a wheelchair who isn't really in a wheelchair. And we kind of had an instinct that there was something not right about that. So we went to the Accessibility Resource Center and we talked to them about it. And they said, yeah, you're right. You should be having, you know, it should be real. And they actually helped us to identify cast members who had a variety of disabilities to, to join our, our, our troop, as it were. So it, 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 you know, we, it took some reaching out and thinking yeah. about it. So another example would be that we, you know, we we've done we do a lot of intentional thinking about not portraying stereotypes around issues like harassment. Mm -hmm. For example, it's not always a particular gender harassing a particular gender, and it, you know these things are varied. And so it's 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 forced us to really think through stories um, at that level. So that we don't fall into that trap, and and uh, there's you have to be vigilant every step of the way because things will happen, and they do where you get called on it and say, "Well, why? You know, how, how did you miss that?" And, you know, so well, you as both of you know, I could continue to ask you questions and have this conversation for hours. There's okay. so much richness here, and you two are both, you know, just professionals and experts in what you do. Your employees are incredibly lucky to have you at the helm and directing uh, and um, the efforts of your companies because you really are definitely bringing something to them that's added value. So I really appreciate uh, all of the thoughtfulness Thank and what you. you guys shared today. I learned stuff from you. So I, I, I always love that. Um, the question we didn't get to, and it's the holy grail question. And so maybe I'll tee it up and, and um, Ernie and ECI can do a session on it, which is just measuring effectiveness. And I note that you both do it differently. You have different things you're looking at and that is 100% appropriate. And maybe for another session, that's something we could focus on. But thank you for letting me uh, pepper you with questions and, and congratulations on your great programs. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Ernie because he's gonna close us out here at the top of the hour or the top of the, the program, so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ingrid. And <clears throat> And I wanna thank you all because um, um, Keturah, Joe, uh, the information you shared was so practical and so rich and, and I think really leading edge. And Ingrid, having you as a, as a moderator is a true honor. We appreciate you being with us. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsor again, Navex, uh, for their support of this forum. Um, the content is going to be available on demand um, for your viewing for the audience until December 15th of 2022. Just log back into the site to access the video and any handouts, share it, the information with your team members, your colleagues. Um, another note, our impact conference for next year, which is um, in early May of 2023, our call for proposals is open. If you'd like to make a presentation, um, go on to the um, uh, go on to the site. There should be a link in the chat. It's also on our homepage, um, and um, and submit a proposal. Uh, earlier today, as a note, we hosted a webinar discussion on the latest updates from the DOJ that were released last week, and um, members can register and watch that free content by either going to the ECI events page or clicking on home. And finally, just to let you know, it's our birthday. ECI is celebrating its 100th anniversary, and we certainly want your uh, input and engagement uh, throughout the this year and the in, into next year. And uh, so there's uh, more information about our centennial on the homepage, at, uh, ECI homepage. Um, one last note, E2C Live Leadership Professional and Ethics and Compliance training starts 11 
October 11th. Um, and that occurs over several days. And so we'd love to have you um, in that program if you have an interest or your colleagues. And also we're having the Inter International uh, Federation of Compliance Associations is hosting their virtual conference October 4th through 6th. And um, great international focus there. And you can find that on our events page. Um, and most of all, thank you to each and every one of you who participated um, uh, in today's session as, as uh, attendees. And we hope to see you again in the future. Uh, thank you, Ingrid, Joe, Katura, great forum. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.